right, Pastor Jason Cooley here with OPBC Online, a ministry of Old Pass Baptist Church in Northfield, Minnesota. And we are coming to you, uh, it's a Saturday morning here, and we're not watching cartoons. Amen. But, uh, that's right, Brother Jim, we're not watching cartoons, but we are here for another OPBC Online. And Brother Jim, we've been discussing artificial intelligence. Uh, yeah. We talked about Google, right? Yeah. And we got more to come on those things, but we've been talking about Google and all those other things and DNA and artificial intelligence. And we decided that it would probably be best if we went ahead and gave a history of AI and kind of explain the concepts, right? Of where it came from and everything. Yep. Where it came from, who were the originators, uh, what were their influences. And ultimately, because when we look at the origins, it'll ultimately determine the end game. Right, right. When you understand what, who developed this and who brought it about and what their goal was and everything, then you and, I come to a, you and I come to a place where we can actually, you know, understand the, the satanic roots of it yeah. and the satanic end of it, like, like Brother Jim said, because – this is all coming. It's all going to streamline to the Antichrist, um, you know, and his and his appearing, his coming. Well, you know, Satan said, "I shall be like the Most High," and and what we recognize as Christians um, with a biblical perspective is God only is omniscient. God only is omnipotent. You know, and it's interesting how technology you know so obviously satan isn't everywhere and we know what revelation says about the mark and well how are you going to facilitate the mark how are you going to monitor everybody how are you going to be able to track everybody and how are you going to be able to do all this if you're not all knowing if you're not all powerful and if you're not uh omnipresent how are you going to do this because if we read the book of revelation and daniel and the different prophetic elements that haven't been, uh, you know, that haven't happened yet. I, how is Satan going to facilitate all this? Well, he's going to use technology. Yeah. And that's the thing. I guess that's the thing that people, I, I want to get people to try to understand, or that's our goal is to try to get people to understand that this is all heading somewhere. Uh, it's, when we think of the mark of the beast and we think of the end times and all those things, we have rarely thought about technology and how that's going to play into that. Exactly. And I, and I, it's, it's kind of funny because a lot of it is a bait and switch. Like for example, the implanted microchip, you know, all the implant is, is programming. It's a progressive step in that direction but they don't want it to be a little chip. They want it to be, whether it's that injected CRISPR that's gonna modify your DNA and change you, you know, or whether it's you're inside an Android and you're uploaded to the internet, um, you know, that, that chip, you know, there was so much focus in the 90s on that chip being, that was gonna be the mark. But that is just, that is just, part of the progress towards the mark yep just a step absolutely so i mean when and that's kind of what we want to do here today is explain that to you and kind of show you the history of ai show you how it all came about i mean and it goes back and there's a great article that we're going to use here um you know that i believe is very helpful and it's called the seven phases of the history of artificial intelligence and it really gives a good summary uh brother jim of excellent yeah of everything i mean you know it's not like arguable history or anything like that it's very very easy to understand and we're going to kind of go through that with you and and share that with you and then give you the biblical understanding of that you know um show you biblically what the bible says about that and I think that as we do that, I think it'll make more sense to you. And then we have other ideas for shows to come that we're going to deal with. You know, there, there are definitely other ideas uh, 
you know, so we're, we're, we got a lot of them actually. And I, I don't want to share all of them with you because we're working on a few of those, those projects, but, but they are going to be very interesting. I think very helpful to you uh, to understand where this is headed, you know, with children, um, yeah. the present use of AI, you know, um, things like that. So we're going we're gonna to go through a lot of those things in the future. But right now, we want to get into the history of AI and kind of share with you what, is, what the history of it is. So we're going to go to this article, Seven Phases of the History of Artificial Intelligence. And uh, I guess I'll start reading, and then, and then we'll, take, we'll, we'll take turns on points, Brother Jim. I'll take the first one. You take the second one. We'll just go down through like that. Sounds good, brother. And uh, then we'll get through everything. Uh, artificial intelligence, AI, is humanity's most powerful technology. Software that solves problems and turns data into insight has already transformed our lives, and the transformation is accelerating, according to Column Chase. Now, that's true. The, 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 it is excel this was written back in 2015, so this is an outdated article. And right. this is from the BBC, it looks like, uh, um, or historyextra.com or whatever. Uh, but you're going to hear a lot of things that are very interesting uh, in this. Uh, so hang on. I, I think it's, I think it's going to be pretty exciting. My, my new book, he says, Surviving AI, three C's, arguing that AI will continue to bring enormous benefits, but that it will also present a series of formidable challenges. The range of possible outcomes is wide, from the terrible to the wonderful, and they are not predetermined. We should monitor the changes that are happening and adopt policies that will encourage the best possible outcomes. You may have heard already the techno technological singularity, which is the idea that a superintelligence will be created sometime this century, and, will, and when that happens, the rate of technological progress will become so fast that ordinary humans cannot keep up. Think about that for a second, Brother Jim. They're, they're admitting that this thing is going to spiral so quickly. Yeah, it's the, it's the doubling of data. And they're already saying that, I forget what it's called, Morse wheel or whatever. And basically, you know, it used to be every 10 years, technology would double. Then it was every five. Then it was every two. Now I think it's every six months. Technology is, is doubling. We, we're watching... We're watching storage capacities. One, we went from a um, from a a spinning hard drive to a fixed state device. Now they've been able to to you know the problem with a static hard drive was that it had to be so large. Now they've shrunk in the microprocessor so small that uh, I have uh, 128 gigs of storage built into my phone, and um, by you know shrinking that down that's what by everything shrinking and getting smaller that's allowing technology to get bigger because exactly. now it's more data in a smaller area yeah what they say on the uh about dna about a strand of dna on the tip of it what they can hold in storage yeah it's incredible it, it's 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 just very hard to <laughs> i forget exactly how much it's incredible it's incredible yeah now. it is incredible so, um, the technological singularity, uh, you, uh, Mike Hoggart has a video, Pastor Mike Hoggart has a video on the technological singularity. Um, and you can, you know, you can listen to that. We, we've touched on a little bit, but, and we may touch on it more in the future as well, but, uh, there's, there's a video out there. There's, there's some things on the singularity and you can look it up on Google. Google talks about the singularity, uh, that that's that merging a man with a machine and that unlimited intelligence. What, is it, what does the Bible say about that, Brother Jim, that gnosis, that knowledge that man was searching after? That was what, that was what Eve was, was enticed to get, yep. right? Was that yep. gnosis, He's that knowledge. God knowing good and evil. Right. So, you know, she was absolutely enticed yep. to grasp hold of that knowledge of good and evil. The, the interesting thing about the singularity is now that you have guys coming out there and they're trying to switch it around and they're calling it the multiplicity. And, but interestingly enough, the whole thing is groupthink. You know, it's like, we're going to put all these, everybody's ideas out there simultaneously 
and we're all going to draw the same conclusion. And mm-hmm. so he got this guy saying, well, don't think of it as a singularity. Think it as the multiplicity, but it's basically the same thing. We're all going to think exactly alike. And by doing that, what will we have? We'll have the mind of God. We'll know everything. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah. that's what they're after. It's the gnosis. That's it's the it. same thing that Satan offered even the garden. And man wants this unlimited <laughs> knowledge. He wants to have it, and he doesn't want to get it from the Word of God. He wants to acquire it on his own or some other way. And that's the beauty of it. I mean, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We have uh, the reason that we can open our Bibles daily and glean from the Scriptures and see things new and fresh every morning is because we literally have the mind of God um, in written form. And there is so many things, even now with reviewing this technology and then looking to the scriptures and seeing it in there. And just like we were talking about how the, how Satan is going to use all of this advancement in technology to basically make, um, make the end time prophecies f- to fulfill them, you know, just like we were talking about last time, you know, how is every world going to, how is everybody going to see these events occur? Well, when you think of technologies like the Google contact lens or the Samsung and it's Wi-Fi and it's plugged into the net and it's, you know, literally like projecting it on your retina. Well, yeah, everybody's going to be able to see everything. all the Absolutely. Same. Absolutely. And this, this, this is the singularity. This is what they're looking And this, this is, it fits into end times Bible prophecy perfectly. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, uh, so the technological singularity is a point beyond which the future, oh, let me back up here a little bit in the same way that a black hole is a singularity between beyond which the laws of physics do not apply. So the technological singularity is a point beyond which the future cannot be readily understood. <laughs> we know the future, brother. <laughs> and we've got the word of God. The Bible tells us yeah. we know where they're going to end, end in the lake of fire. Yeah. Well, before we get to that, if we do, there may be another massive discontinuity, which I call the economic singularity. This is the point at which almost every job can be done cheaper and better by an AI than by a human. Now, we're going to have a show coming up on that, so we're going to save that yeah. concept. Uh, because we're going to talk about that, aren't we? Uh, We're we're going to talk about the dark side of AI and deal with some of those things in the future. Okay. So uh, hang on and stay tuned for that. That, that may be the next show that we, that we cover. Uh, But to help us understand how artificial intelligence got us to this remarkable point in time, here are seven vignettes, 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 vignettes. What is a vignette? Uh, it's like a, uh, it's like a small portrait. Ah. A vignette. A vignette. I thought it was vinegar or something. Oh. <laughs> anyway. That's a vinaigrette. It's vinaigrette. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I have some of that. That's good stuff. <laughs> okay. Anyway, I'll, I'll move on here. So I'll take number one. Okay. Number one, Greek myths. Now this is interesting because a lot of the greatest. Um, stories that have been told have an element of truth to them from Greek mythology. They steal and they raped it from the Bible and yeah. stole some of these things from the word of God. Right. Yeah. And then they pervert those stories. Mm-hmm. Humanize them. Right. Humanize them. So, okay. So number one, Greek myths, stories about artificially intelligent creatures go back at least as far as the ancient Greeks. Hephaestus, I think I said that name right. Vulcan to the Romans was the blacksmith of Olympus, as well as creating Pandora, the first woman. He created lifelike metal automatons. Automatons, yeah. Automatons, sorry. Auto, automatons, is that it? Automatons. Automatons. Sounds like something from a Japanese animation. Automatons. <laughs> sorry, I don't want to get back into my strong spiritual warfare. Okay, anyway. Sure. He created lifelike metal automatons. Are those anything like the Autobots? Uh, yes. Probably are, aren't they? Yeah. Hephaestus 
Hephaestus, Hephaestus, whatever, however you say his name, had an unpromising start in life. Greek myths often have multiple forms, and in some versions, Hephaestus was the son of Zeus and Hera, while in others, he was Hera's alone. One of his parents threw him from Mount Olympus, and after falling for a whole day, he landed badly, became lame. Now think about this, okay? So he's, he's wrong, right? He's been created wrong, right? Mm-hmm. So he's going to write that wrong. Yeah, and he, he was basically cast out of heaven. Right. And what's he going to do? He's going to build something. Mm-hmm. You get, you, you get it? Mm-hmm. There's, it's going somewhere, right? Yeah. He was rescued by the people of Lemnos, and when Hera saw the ingenious creations he went on to build, she relented, and, and he became the only Greek god to be readmitted to Olympus. Hmm. Okay? So he created and he built something. His creations were constructed from metal, but their purposes varied widely. The most sinister was the Caucasian eagle, cast in bronze, whose job was to gore the titan Prometheus every day ripping out his liver as a punishment for the crime of giving the gift of fire to humanity. Nice. Right. So, okay. So she, that's so that's a beautiful story. Beautiful. Wonderful. So he created, so he created an artificial intelligent robot to war for him. Yeah. Kind of like the Terminator. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay, so story. These stories aren't all new, are they? Nope. And these stories have a point. They're going somewhere. Why do you think Skynet, Terminator? Well, we'll get to that when we talk about Hollywood, won't we? Yeah. But anyway, so we'll, we'll get we'll pick that up again here. His creations. Okay, so at the other end of the spectrum were Hephaestus's automated drinks trolleys. The Creasio tripods were a set of 20 wheeled devices that propelled themselves in and out of the halls of Olympus during the feasts of the gods. So they created metal servants. So remember, remember, uh, uh, meet George Jetson. Yeah. What was the dog's name? The robot dog. I don't know. His son, Leroy. Yeah. And, uh, Tom and Judy. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. I don't remember. Oh, I Pluto. No. I don't I don't know, but remember remember the maid? Yeah, the maid was a robot. She was a robot. What was her name? Do you remember it? Judy? I don't I don't know. That was weird. I yeah, I, I don't know if that I don't know. I don't, if, the, if that was his if that was his wife's name. Oh no, wait. Was, oh, I forget. The robot's name. That was I don't a long know. time ago. Yeah. Meet George Jetson. Let's see. All right. Yeah, George Jetson. But he what did he have, though? He had a family. Oh, his dog, Astro. Astro, that's it. The dog and they dog. were in Orbit City. Yeah, yeah. How about that? Huh. Yeah. All George, oh, my goodness. Okay, hold that thought about George Jetson because we're going to pick that up with the Hollywood one, okay? Yeah, okay. Because I just found some interesting things out. So we'll, we'll pick that one up. That's kind of interesting. Anyway, um, so see how the stories were there? Yep. They're telling something that was going to happen. Mm-hmm. They knew it. There's a plan. Well, see, I think this goes right into um, mimicking and copying the Bible and borrowing from it. You know what I mean? is what they're doing is obviously the Bible is filled with prophecy, uh, fulfilled prophecy and future prophecy, and them in wanting to be like God and in showing that they have the gnosis and the knowledge, they want to, one, attempt to predict the future to be like God, and two, they want to project the future that they desire. Right which is in direct conflict with the scriptures. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So Greek mythology right here, okay, talked about AI, artificial intelligence, and creating these machines or these beings that would do things. 
for yeah. us. And, and, and we're going to kind of get to some of that uh, later on, but we'll pick it up there. So that's number one. Okay, Jim, why don't you take uh, number two? Yes, yeah, so stage two here is a little bit of a mixture of, um, and this kind of gets into the whole DNA part as well, but the first F, uh, the first SF Frankenstein and Rosum's Universal Robots. <clears throat> Although numerous earlier stories contain plot elements and ideas that recur throughout science fiction, the author Brian Aldiss claimed Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, which was written in 1818, was the genre's real starting point because the hero makes a deliberate decision to employ scientific methods and equipment. It is therefore appropriate that contrary to popular belief, the title refers to the mad scientist figure rather than the monster. Hmm. And this is one thing that I wanted to um, also interject about the Greek mythology plays, and that is the, um, the term uh, deus ex machina, which was a, it's, they've kind of corrupted it now. Um, but if you look at the term uh, deus ex machina, what that basically entails is, um, oh, I see, I'm in the wrong second. It's got it. There we go. Um, deus ex machina is Latin, okay, which comes from the Greek, meaning God from the machine. So basically, um, you know, when the Greeks wanted to present an actor on stage as a god, they would use some type of a machine like a pulley or a trap door, and this would represent that actor as a god. And right. uh, that's where this term, deus ex machina, got started. But basically what it is is how do you mimic God or how do you portray yourself as God? And when you think of this whole machine and God, it really kind of starts making all the AI and robotic stuff make a lot more sense because oh, yeah. this has been their modus operandi since the beginning, basically. Yep, it's all coming to a head. Yep. <clears throat> While Frankenstein seems like a grotesque romance and very much of its time, the 1920 play R.U.R., or Rossum's Universal Robots. Now, this is from 1920. Rossum's Universal Robots introduces themes that still concern us today. Its Czech author, Carl Kapek, received plaudits when the play was first staged, but later critics, critics have been less kind. Isaac Asimov called it terribly bad, and it is rarely read or staged today. Nevertheless, it introduced the idea of a robot uprising that wipes out mankind, which has prompted a huge number of stories since. And it foresaw concerns about widespread technological unemployment as a consequence of automation. And we are going to talk about in the future, we're going to talk about, have a show about the financial impact of AI. Yeah. We're going to deal with that in the future. Yeah. And of course, it gave the world the word robot. So this 1920 play is where the term robot came from. Capex robots are androids with a human appearance as well as the ability to think for themselves. So they were artificially intelligent. They were what science wants to refer to as a sentient being. They had their own sense of being okay in the uprising the robots kill all the humans except for one and the book ends with two of them discovering human-like emotions which seems to set them up to begin the cycle all over again it, isn't that isn't that something because that it reminds me of uh when i was a kid or younger i watched uh star trek the next generation and in the first Star Trek, there was, there was Spock, who really had no emotions, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, 
he was able to act on intellect alone. He had evolved. They were Vul the Vulcans had evolved to not use emotions for decisions, right? It's interesting because we talked about the Vulcans earlier. You know, the uh, when we were referencing the Greeks, that Greek god, uh, the the name of the Roman version of that Greek god was Vulcan. Yep. Yeah. So when you see when you see spock right he that that the vulcans had evolved to a place to where they didn't have emotions really they didn't use emotions they did not make decisions based on emotions right but they made it based on knowledge right um now in the next generation there was no vol there was there, the vulcan wasn't one of the main characters but data was one of the main characters and data was what an android. an android yeah and data had an emotion chip right that they could put in him yeah that would give him emotions and make him more like a human yeah right yeah because all data was was an android that was very strong very powerful and he could he understood how to run everything control everything and answer every question with the with information. What did we talk about last week, though? You know, with trying to make everybody live forever. What did they said before before the age of forty? What were the two leading causes of death? Accidents and violence. Right. Where does violence come from? Yep, emotion. Predominantly, it comes from your emotions, right? Right. Yep. Yep. Because anybody acting in a logical, rational manner ob obviously wouldn't slaughter somebody. Right. So you see that, like that, that's that's been a common theme. It's not new. Um, that's that was what back in 1851. Yeah. So now this robot, they put that in in Star Trek and everything. So we're being prepared for all this stuff. We'll get more to Hollywood here, uh, you know, a little bit later on. Uh, but anyway, we see this this theme, this AI, this history of AI. Now we come to some interesting characters. I'm going to read about this Charles Babbage, but mm -hmm. then I'm going to let you expound on a little bit, Brother Jim, with, okay. with some of the information of his biography a little bit, okay? Yep. So uh, the first design, number three, the next stage was Charles Babbage and Ada Lovelace. The first design for a computer was drawn up by Charles Babbage, a Victorian academic inventor. Babbage never finished the construction of his devices, but in 1991, a machine was built to his design using tolerances achievable in his day. It showed that his machine could have worked back in the Victorian era. Babbage, different, Babbage's difference engine designed in 1822 would carry out basic mathematical functions, and the analytical engine design never completed would carry out general purpose computations. It would accept as inputs the outputs of previous computations recorded on punch cards. Babbage declined both a knighthood and a peerage, being an advocate of life peerages, Half his brain is preserved at the Royal College of Surgeons, and the other half is on display in London's Science Museum. So I'm going to stop right there and let you explain. Then I'll pick up with Ada Lovelace. But I want you to explain who is this man and what does this have to do with artificial intelligence and why is this man so important when it comes right. to artificial intelligence? And why would, okay, this guy died in the 1800s and somebody felt the need to put his brain somewhere and and what okay and when you die what is your brain when you're dead it's just like your heart or anything else but uh okay so i'm just going to give you some background information on charles babbage uh he lived from 1791 to 1871. Um, Wikipedia says, considered a father of the computer, Babbage is credited with inventing the first mechanical computer, just like this author is talking about in our article. Um, Primer Magazine says, if you use a computer, you have Charles Babbage to thank. Um, Charles Babbage is popularly acknowledged as the father of computing. Mechanical computer was invented by a mathematics professor 
at Cambridge, England, named Charles Babbage. Charles is even considered by many people worldwide to be the father of the modern day computer because of his inventions in the mechanical computing engine. Okay, so this guy was a professor in Cambridge, England in the 1800s. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read you a passage from one of his writings. Uh, this was written in 1864. It was, this is an excerpt from Passages from the Life of a Philosopher. Now you just remember that these people are God haters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'll. Uh, yeah, you. You're gonna pick up on this here real quick, and I just want you to understand that these people are inventors of evil things. They hate yeah. God. They're at a war with God. They're at war against God, and the devil is pushing them and pumping them and priming them and using them in his war against God. Now, listen up as you hear this, because I'm telling you what, it's very startling uh, to hear about. So, go ahead, brother Jim. It's, you know, if, if this man did not write this with his own hand, you would, it would be harder to believe, but <clears throat> this is him writing first person. I gathered all the information I could on the subject and was soon informed that there was a peculiar process by which the devil might be raised and become personally visible. I carefully collected from the traditions of different boys the visible forms in which the Prince of Darkness, capitalized, had been recorded to have appeared. After long thinking over the subject, although checked by the belief that the inquiry was wicked, my curiosity at length overbounds my fears, and I resolved to attempt to raise the devil. Mm. Naughty people, I was told, had made written compacts with the devil and had signed them with their names written in their own blood. Listen to when this is, though. What year is this? 1860. This is 1864. This was the time of the rise of spiritism. Yep. It's, and this is something was happening in the world at this time. Yep. A rise of spiritism. The King James Bible was being challenged. They were bringing out revisionists, Westcott and Hort, the ghostly guild. All these things were like around that same 20, 30 year period. Yep, exactly. So <clears throat> these men had become very rich and great men during their life. A fact which might be well known, but after death, they were described as having suffered and continuing to suffer physical torments through eternity. Another fact which, to my uninstructed mind, it seemed difficult to prove. Having closed the door, and I believe opened the window, I proceeded to cut my finger and draw a circle on the floor with the blood which flowed from the incision. I then placed myself in the center of the circle and either said or read, the Lord's Prayer backwards. This I accomplished at first with some trepidation and in great fear towards the close of the scene. I then stood still in the center of that magic and superstitious circle, looking with intense anxiety in all directions, especially at the window and at the chimney. The chimney? Is he looking for Santa Claus? So he thought Santa was gonna come down the chimney. <laughs> yeah. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> My uninstructed faculties led me from doubts of the existence of a devil to doubts of the book and the religion which asserted him to be a living being. Mm. So basically, Charles Babbage wanted to contact the devil. He wanted to contract with the devil to be right. rich and famous, right? But then when the when he now <laughs> he thinks the devil didn't show up <laughs> i think maybe the devil did show up <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> but absolutely um, absolutely the devil showed up and deceived him his yeah. whole life and he died and went to a devil's hell and also gave him the knowledge the gnosis that he needed to create this first computer model exactly and artificial intelligence so, you know, he summoned up a devil for a reason. You know, the height of the devil's power is to make you think that, make uh, you others think that they did all these things on their own, yeah. that he, he ascended up to the height, that, you know, that 
that you've done all this under your own knowledge and power and everything else. Yeah. That's and you've right. really done it by the power of the devil. That's right. Wow. Yeah, there was also, um, and, you know, we were talking about this whole Cambridge thing, and we know with Westcott and Hort and the Ghostly Guild and all yep. that stuff. Well, Babbage was part of the Ghost Club. It was called the Ghost Club, or they also called it the Lunatic Club. I remember that. That's, that's where the, at the moon, at the, at, they do something towards the moon at night when they go home or whatever, right? Yep. Yeah, the <laughs> Lunatic Club. Is yep. that part of, was that the same lunar society? If it wasn't the same, it was very similar. It was the same concept. Hmm. Yeah. This is, this is an excerpt from the British Quarterly Review um, from 1865. <clears throat> so doubts respecting the existence of a devil led, Mr. led to Mr. Babbage's, Mr. Babbage's doubts respecting the authenticity the authenticity, the authenticity of the Bible. Nor will it astonish any reader to learn that when at Cambridge, Mr. Babbage and some of his college companions formed themselves into a ghost club and made it their duty to collect evidence on the subject of apparitions. If they heard of a phantom, these spiritual detectives speedily put themselves into pursuit. Hmm. And basically, the premise of their club was to discredit and disprove that spirits and devils existed. Because if that was the case, that basically the whole premise was we want to prove that the Bible is wrong. We want to prove that Satan doesn't exist. And if Satan and devils don't exist, then the Bible is a lie. Wow. And that was the entire premise of what they were doing. I'm looking at the Royal Society. Let's see. I'm looking to see. I have a hunch, and I don't know if I'm right. Yep, I was right. I was right. Are you ready to listen to this? Okay. Seldom, if ever, in the history of technology has so long an interval separated the invention of a device and its realization in hardware as that which elapsed between Charles Babbage's description, 1837, of the analytical engine, a mechanical digital computer, which, viewed with the benefit of a century and a half's hindsight, anticipated virtually every aspect of present-day computers. Charles Babbage was an eminent figure in his day, elected Lucasian professor of mathematics at Cambridge in 1828, the same chair held by Newton, and in our days, Stephen Hawking. Oh, yep. that makes sense. Yep. He resigned this, this, his, this professorship in 1839 to, vote, to devote his full attention to the analytical engine. Babbage was a fellow of the Royal Society. Here we go. Yep. There, I yep. knew it. I knew the connection was here. And co-founder of the British Association of the Advancement of Science, the Royal Astronomical Society and the Statistical Society of London. Listen, he was a close acquaintance of Charles Darwin. I knew wow. it. I knew that's yeah. where I heard that. And I bet yeah. you that's where I heard that loveless name too. I yep. bet you she yep. was a friend of, I knew I, Darwin, in my, you're right. in my yeah. research on, on, on Charles Darwin, I have a yep. series on Charles Darwin that I did. I remember hearing some of these names and I, I wouldn't surprise me or shock me at all. If that was part of it, that makes perfect sense to me. I knew there, I, I knew that that name, that lunar society and everything else. It just made sense to me that Charles Darwin had to be connected to this some somehow. Yeah. And they were friends. There you go. And that makes perfect sense. Yep. Because the father of modern day evolution and the father of the analytical computer and artificial intelligence had to be connected one way or yeah. another. Wow. How about that? Now, I've got to look here. You go, I'm sorry if I interrupted you, brother. Um, no, brother, that was the end of my background on Babbage. Okay, because... Let me check something here. I'm an, I, and I apologize to those that are listening. Uh, I'm doing this online. I mean, doing this live through this. Uh, I was just curious if Ada Lovelace knew Charles Darwin, and I am guessing that they knew each other. But um, anyway, um, 
it wouldn't surprise me. While you're looking, where yep. where it talks about Babbage collaborating with Lovelace. Yeah, go ahead and read that. Okay. Uh, did we say that Babbage declined both knighthood? And yep, we did. Yep, we did. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Babbage collaborator, collaborator Ada Lovelace has been described as the world's first computer programmer, thanks to some of the algorithms she created for the analytical engine. Famously, Ada was the only legit, legitimate child of the Victorian poet and adventurer Lord Byron. Although she never knew her father, she was buried next to him when she died at the early age of 36. There is controversy about the extent of her contribution to Babbage's work, but whether or not she was the first programmer, she was certainly the first program debugger. Yep. Makes perfect sense. Her mindset of poetical science led her to ask questions about the analytical engine, as shown in her notes, examining how individuals and societies relate to technology as a collaborative tool. She died of uterine cancer in 1852 at the age of 36. So she was very young mm -hmm. uh, when she died. And she was kind of a, uh, of, you know, uh, kind of a royalty, I guess you could say. Yep. yep, um, yep. And she had a lot of, she had a lot of connections. She was connected to Charles Dickens. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, and a few others and, and some famous scientists. It does not look at that she had uh, any connection to Darwin, though, uh, that I can see anyway from this. But it doesn't really matter because everybody else was. Um, there are notes around her stuff about artificial intelligence. Section G also contains Lovelace's dismissal of artificial intelligence. She wrote that the analytical engine has no pretensions whatever to originate anything. It can do whatever we know how to order it to perform. It can follow analysis, but it has no power of anticipating any analytical relations of truth. The objection has been the subject of much debate and rebuttal, for example. But anyway, it was proven by Alan Turing, computing machinery and intelligence and everything else, that that wasn't the case. Yeah, and we're going to talk about Turing next. Yep, actually. yep, we're going to talk about him next. So anyway, it's, it's fascinating that these people were all connected, though, connected to Charles Darwin, connected to all these God-haters. They're all they connected, all man. They all hate God. Yep. They're all connect. They're all connected. Edison, the Ghostly Guild, uh, Theosophy, uh, um, the Lunar Society. What's her name? Who's the uh, uh, the Theosophist? Uh, Elena Blavatsky. Blavatsky. They're all connected. They all wanted that. They all wanted the knowledge. Yep. They all hated God. Yep. So we see this occult connection to to AI. Yep. Uh, pretty powerful occult connection to AI. To be honest with you. Um, okay, so number four, Alan Turing and Bletchley Park. The brilliant British mathematician and code breaker Alan Turing is often described as the father of both computer science and artificial intelligence. His most famous achievement was breaking the German naval ciphers at the code breaking center at Bletchley Park during the Second World War. He used complicated machines known as bombs which eliminated enormous numbers of incorrect solutions to the code so as to arrive at the correct solution. His work is estimated to have shortened the war by two years, but incredibly, his reward was to be prosecuted for homosexuality and obliged to accept inter injections of synthetic oestrogen that rendered him impotent. He died two years later, and it took 57 years before British government apologized for this barbaric behavior. <laughs> so, they so he's Assad. He was a sodomite. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Hmm. Uh, let's see. Uh, look up Alan Turing on uh, Wikipedia, yep. Jim, while I'm reading this. Uh, okay. His work is estimated. Okay, so basically he was a homosexual. They wanted to inject him with something to, to make him stop, make him impotent so he couldn't do any of his homosexuality. Mm -hmm. So not all the world accepted homosexuality. Uh, before the war in 1936, Turing had already devised a theoretical device called a Turing machine. It consisted of an infinitely long tape divided into squares, each bearing a single symbol. Operating according to the direction of an instruction table, a reader moves the tape back and forth, reading one square and one symbol at a time. Together with his PhD tutor, Alonzo Church, he formulated the Church Turing thesis which says that a Turing machine can simulate the logic of any computer algorithm. 
Turing is also famous for inventing a test for artificial consciousness called the Turing test, yep. in which a machine proves that it's conscious it that it is conscious by rendering a panel of human judges unable to determine that it is not, which is essential to the test that we humans apply to each other. The Turing test. Yep, that's yeah, very- that's, that's the new test that's under question with, uh, for example, they have this new autonomous car. I don't think it was Google's car, but they have this new uh, autonomous car that was not programmed. What it did is it observed a human driving and it taught itself to drive. Uh huh. So now they're trying to, you know, they applied the Turing test to it and they're saying that it's totally autonomous, but there's a lot of, uh, they, when we get into that stuff, yeah, it's starting to get crazy. And that's where, when we get into the, present day of AI, you'll start to see that these scientists will admit that they don't know what's making this stuff do what it's doing. No. So basically, they're admitting the devils that, that th- there's devils and <laughs> stuff is basically what they're doing. Alan Turing is a very interesting man. Oh, uh, yeah. Tur- you know, he was, pro- he was prosecuted in 1952 for homosexual acts. When by the Lab- Laboracci Amendment, gross indecency was still criminal in UK, he accepted chemical castration treatment with DES as an alternative to prison. Turing died in 1954, 16 days before his 42nd birthday, from cyanide poisoning. An inquest determined his death as suicide, but it has been noted that the known evidence is also consistent with accidental poisoning. In 2009, following an internet campaign, British Prime Minister Gordon Brown made a public apology on behalf of the British government for the appalling way he was treated. Queen Elizabeth II granted him a posthumous pardon in 2013. The Alan Turing Law is now an informal term for a 2017 law in the UK that retroactively pardons men cautioned or convicted under historical legislation that outlawed homosexual acts. Yeah. Yes. Sod propaganda. Yeah. Sod prop. Sod prop. Sod prop eight. (laughs) Yeah, I'm just, I'm curious what his, you know, um, what his religious background was. Um, Let's see if it says. I'm just, I'm looking here to see if there's anything on it because, uh, let's see, his early life. Let's see. Just curious to find out who this man really is. We don't have to go too in-depth with it, but, you know, just as we're looking at this history of AI, I think it's kind of interesting to find out that, you know, oh, some have speculated that, uh, let's see, was the cause of Turing's atheism and materialism. So he was a materialist, it looks like. Uh, He was an atheist. So a God-hater, right? Yep, yep. The fool has said in his heart there is no God, right? Yeah, and just consequently, consequently, he was a sodomite. Sodomite, well, and you know what? It makes perfect sense to me that he would be a sodomite, right? Because he did not want to admit that there is a God. Yeah. Um, and that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, but became yeah. vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Right? Wow, this is kind of interesting. The logo... The logo of Apple Inc. is often erroneously referred to as a tribute to Alan Turing, with the bite mark a reference to his death. Both the designer of the logo and the company deny that there is any homage to Turing in the design, even though it's a upside-down rainbow, and it's a bite out of an apple, and he was poisoned by cyanide. And yeah, yeah, that's pretty wild. Hmm. Wow. You know what else? He he developed this program called Delilah. There, the further developed his knowledge of electronics with the assistance of engineer Donald Bailey. Together, they undertook the design and construction of a portable, secure voice communications machine codenamed Delilah. Wow. It was intended for different applications, lacking capability for use with long-distance radio transmissions, and in any case, Delilah was compelled too late to be used during the war. Though the system worked fully with Turing demonstrating it to officials by encrypting and decrypting a recording of a Winston Churchill speech, Delilah was not adopted for use. Turing also consulted with Bell Labs on the development of 
Sig Sally, a secure voice system that was used in the latter years of the war. Wow. You want to hear something else that's another crazy quote here? Mm -hmm. Stephen, Re Stephen Fry has recounted asking Steve Jobs whether the design was intentional, saying that Jobs' response was, God, we wish it were. So when they asked Jobs, hey, was this, was this, um, was your logo an, an homage to touring? You know, uh, Jobs, one, he blasphemes the name of God, and then he says that they wish it, that they wish it was this homage to this homosexual guy. That, mm -hmm. Oh, man, all these guys are. And see yep. how they're all tied together? Yeah. I mean, is Apple tied to this guy? It's crazy. There's, they're all related. They're all interrelated. They're all tied together. Mm-hmm. Yes, they are, and they all have a, a one thing. They hate God, and they're building the kingdom of Antichrist. Yep, they are the same father. They're marching, uh, you know, they're marching forward with their, with their God-hating plan and plot. Uh, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Yes, Only he, yeah. you know, so the Bible is very clear about that. Okay, so he had his test for artificial consciousness, which, whew, yeah, that's scary, but we'll move on, okay, because we could go on and on and on and yeah. on with that, but it is scary, and we'll probably cover that in a show coming up in the future, so because it's kind of scary when you start to think about it. Yes. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. You know, um, I remember when I was a kid, the, the show Short Circuit. You know, number, number five, five is alive. Number five is alive. Programming. Yep. It was all predictive programming. We were yep. being prepped for it. So, all right. Number five, Brother Jim, go ahead and read that. The Dartmouth Conference. The point when artificial intelligence became a genuine science was a month long conference at Dartmouth College in New Hampshire, the summer of 1956, which was premised on. The conjecture that every feature of intelligence can in principle be so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it. Hmm. <laughs> so what they're saying is that we can describe intelligence so accurately and break it down to its however many facets there are that we can clearly program a computer to do that. Hmm. We can simulate it. But by, but by programming a computer to do those, so that doesn't even make any sense because by programming a computer to do it, it's not intelligent. You're still giving it the input. Right. You know, that, that's why they have these new ones that will watch stuff and, and learn. I, I don't know, man. <laughs> okay. Um, Some enti something is going to take over those things and help them. And yeah. I think it's devils. Yep. Yeah, if it's not already doing it. Mm -hmm. The organizers include John McCarthy, Marvin Minsky, Claude Shannon, Nat Nathaniel Rochester, all of whom went on to contribute enormously to the field. Now, this is where it's going to start getting interesting because in comes something else, another uh, organization that is very dangerous and yeah. is not – it's not fun. Not, not, yeah. not, not, a, not a good place. And, uh, but I'll let you go ahead and keep reading. In the years following the Dartmouth Conference, impressive advances were made in AI. Machines were built that could solve school math problems – and a program called Eliza became the world's first chatbot, occasionally fooling users into thinking that it was conscious. These successes and many others were made possible in part by surprisingly free spending by military research bodies, notably the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA. Originally, uh -oh. ARPA, which was ARPA. in 1958 by good old President Eisenhower as part of the shocked U.S. reaction to the launch of Sputnik. 
the first satellite to be placed into orbit around the Earth. Uh, DARPA. We know what DARPA is, don't we? Uh -huh. Now, what is DARPA into? DARPA is into all these crazy dog-like autonomous creatures that walk around. And if you look at some of those, if you go on YouTube and look at some of those, um, you know, DARPA makes battle robots is what they do. That's, that's part of what they do. And that's well, it's the part of what they do that they're actually admitting to. Yep. President Eisenhower. Isn't he the one that warned against the military industrial complex? Yep. Yeah, and he's also, wasn't it Eisenhower that supposedly signed the Grenada Treaty, I think? You know, I'm not sure. I'd have to look that up. I think that was Eisenhower. And when you start thinking about all that stuff, man. DARPA is independent from other military research and development and reports directly to senior Department of Defense Management. DARPA has about 240 employees, of whom 13 are in management and a close to 140 at technical staff. DARPA-funded projects have provided significant technologies that influenced many non-military fields, such as computer networking and graphical use, user interfaces and information technology. DARPA's original mission established in 1958 was to prevent technology surprise like the launch of Sputnik, which signaled to the, that the Soviets had beaten the U.S. into space. Thanks, DARPA. Thanks, DARPA. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> the optimism <laughs> of the nascent AI research community overflowed into hubris. Herbert Simon said, the shape of automation for men and management 1965 that machines will be capable okay this was in 1965 that machines will be capable within 20 years of doing any work a man can do mm. marvin minsky said two years later in computation finite and infinite machines that within a generation the problem of creating artificial intelligence will substantially be solved but hindsight is a wonderful thing, and it is unfair to criticize harshly the pioneers of AI for underestimating the difficulty of replicating the feats of which the, hum the human brain is capable. Oh, boy. And maybe, maybe the lag of all the AI is just a clandestine validation that it's just programming and it's not devil possession. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yep. DARPA's earliest predecessor of the internet. DARPA's done a lot of things. Yeah, the internet, right? Yep. Yep. I heard that rooster and that's not, that's not, a android that's a real rooster that's a real rooster right he doesn't lay any eggs though no he doesn't that's good though right that is good okay so uh um we know that darpa from what i understand they're also into some mind control type stuff too some mind uh over machine type stuff yep. darpa's biotech biotech chief says 2017 will blow our minds the pentagon's research division is betting its high risk high reward programs will change medicine the pentagon's research and development division darpa the creative force behind the internet and gps retooled itself three years ago to create a new office dedicated to unraveling biology's engineering secrets the new Biological Technologies Offices is a mission to harness the power of biological systems and design new defense technology. Over the past year, with a budget of $296 million, it has been exploring challenges including memory improvement, human-machine symbiosis. Super soldier. Oh! Yep, super soldier. DARPA, or the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, is hoping for some big returns. Captain America. The director of its BTO, neuroprosthetic researcher Justin Sanchez, recently spoke with Scientific American about what to expect from his office in 2017. 
including work on neural implants to aid healthy people in their everyday lives and other advances that he says will change the game. In aid medicine. healthy people because we know we need healthy people need help to be more healthy, I guess. Mm. I so, Maybe you know, I, brother Jim, maybe I should save this article for like the present day AI and we'll do another yep. show on this. Cause I mean, I could keep going with this, yep. but we'll, we just gave you a little hint of it, but I'll continue on with this. We'll save this because DARPA's working on breaking the genetic code and that's present day yep. stuff. So that's the CRISPR stuff. Yeah, we're going to get, we'll get into that. We'll leave that alone for now. We'll go ahead and continue with our, where we're at here right now. And basically, I want to say that it was DARPA that created uh, an American. Say that again? DARPA was, is the one that was kind of portrayed as creating Captain America, you know, through genetics and steroids and all that stuff. Sure. Yeah. Makes sense, doesn't it? Yep. Creating the super soldier, Darwin super soldier. Yep. Herr Hitler super soldier. Yep. Ubermensch. Yeah. Going back to Nietzsche. Yeah. Hmm. They're all connected. Yeah, I know they are a bunch of devils. <laughs> Number six, right? Yep. AI seasons, the AI winters in 1973, and early 1980s, when it became apparent that AI was going to take much longer to achieve its goals than originally expected, there were rumblings of discontent among funding bodies. They crystallized in the 19, in 1973 Light Hill Report, which highlighted the combinatorial problem, whereby a simple calculation involving two or three variables becomes intractable when the number of variables is increased. The first AI winter lasted from 1974 until around 1980. It was followed in the 1980s by another boom. Thanks to the advent of expert systems and the Japanese fifth generation computer initiative, which adopted massively parallel programming. Expert systems limit themselves to solving narrowly defined problems from single do domains of expertise, for instance, litigation, using vast databanks. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. They avoid the messy complications of everyday life and do not tackle the perennial problem of trying to inculcate, inculcate common sense. The funding dried up again in the late 1980s because the difficulties of the task being addressed was once again. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Man, I keep sneezing here. Increasingly, uh, let's see, where was I? Uh, the funding dried up again in the yep. late 1980s. Because the difficulties of the task being addressed was once again underestimated and also because desktop computers and what we now call servers overtook mainframes in speed and power, rendering very expensive legacy machines redundant. The second AI winter thawed in the early 1990s and AI research has since been increasingly well-funded. Some people are worried that the present excitement and concern about the progress in AI is merely the latest boom phase, characterized by hype and alarmism, and will shortly be followed by another damaging bust. I don't think so. Nope. But there are reasons for AI researchers to be more sanguine this time around. AI has crossed a threshold and gone mainstream for the simple reason that it works. It is powering services that make a huge difference in people's lives and which enable companies to make a lot of money. Fairly small improvements in AI now make millions of dollars for companies that introduce them. AI is here to stay because it is lucrative. There you go. You know, and that's the main, that's the main thing. It is very lucrative. Uh, when we see, when I can go and I can, I can talk to Siri, you know, and, and, uh, Siri will pull up on my computer, you know, and, and I can, or on my Mac and, and even in my car, I, and I'm, I might do a video at the end of this, maybe in this, in this video or the next, I might add this to it where I actually use CarPlay and use Siri to interact. Yeah. Merging, the merging of man and machine using technology. That's right. So it is it isn't going anywhere. It is speeding nope. forward at light speed. Yep. And you know it is because DARPA is involved with it, and government is funding this at an extreme rate. Private 
people are funding AI at a at a at a at a astronaut. What what is the AI? What is it? What what do we say it was? How many billion dollar industry, Jim? Big data is a one hundred and fifty billion dollar. One hundred fifty billion dollars. Yep, and that's just the algorithms. That's just the metadata that they're collecting from everybody. Mm -hmm. yep. And so. the president just said, "Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, you can, you guys can just um, you know basically secretively take all that data, bundle it together, sell it for a hundred and fifty billion dollars, and I mean that's all of our private data. Make America great again. Yep, and it's going to be great. Make America great again." Two Corinthians is the whole ball game right there. Yeah, that's it. It's the whole ball game. <laughs> it's tremendously big and huge. Yeah. It is Donald Trump size huge. The other thing that I think is real interesting is when you think about it too, they, they, you know, the original databases were called servers. So originally, you know, computers were viewed as servants. Okay, I need this, right? And what does it do? It goes and gets it for you, right? That's a server. Oh, hey, I need this. It goes and gets it, right? But now what's AI? AI is I'm going to guess what you need before you need it. And I'm, you're already going to have it. So it's not mm -hmm. going to be a server. It's going to predict what you want, and it's going to have it for you before you ask for it. Well, and that's already happening right now. Yep, that's Google. Uh, Google does it automatically. I mean, they just yeah. they they have predictive programming on there automatically that is set up to predict what you want. Yeah. I mean, I remember talking about something or typing something to somebody, and then boom, it shows up on my Google browser. Yep. No, that's that's an algorithm, right? Yep. Supposedly. <laughs> yeah. Or a devil, one of the two. I don't yeah, know. One or the other. But then we come to number seven here. Oh, speaking of devils, familiars, right? Uh -huh. so what, how can a familiar fake you out? A familiar fakes you out because it's familiar with everything about you. There you go. It follows you around. It watches everything you do. And then, just like Saul with the witch at Endor, right? And he wanted to... Uh, call up Samuel, right? So Samuel is called up. And, you know, obviously, I, I don't think that was Samuel. I think that was a familiar spirit. But it was able to trick Saul because it was a familiar. Hmm. And it's, it's interesting because that's basically what the predict, that's the premise of the predictability of artificial intelligence. We're going to hang around you and we're going to gather all this data and it's, most of it is even seemingly inconsequential and we're going to put it together with an algorithm and then predict stuff. Well, and we're going to, you know, we're going to deal with that probably in the show to come here because there's a lot of impacts that this has, yep. you know, uh, and I guess we'll do probably do a show on present day AI and in that and kind of deal with that because there's some predictive programs out there that are predicting things like crimes that are going to take place. Yep. yep. You and know, police and all that thought crimes and all that stuff. Yep. Yeah. So there's LAPD's computer program prevents crime by predicting it. Yeah. So we're going to talk about that in another show. We're not going to talk about today because we're covering the history, but we'll pick it up on another show and we'll, we'll deal with that. Um, how how we use AI every day and present day AI and everything like that. So, all right, now we have number seven here, AI in Hollywood. Yeah. And this is where you get into this, uh, where our generation has been set up to accept this. Yeah. You know, our generation has been set up to accept AI from way back. You know, so... Go ahead and start reading, uh, Brother Jim, and okay. and we'll get into some of this, and then we'll stop and think about some of these different things that we've been set up to accept. Okay. It is commonly thought that Hollywood hates AI, 
or rather that it loves to portray artificial intelligence as a threat to humans. In this view, the archetypal movie AI is a cold clinical enemy that takes us to the brink of extinction. Oddly, we usually defeat them because we have emotions and we love our families. And for some unfathomable reason, this makes us superior to entities which operate on pure reason. Well, notice this article. This is disgusting. It's not exactly like, like your emotions and your, your love is like this a terrible thing. <laughs> hindrance to your, to your evolution as a man, you know, is the way they see it. Like yep. it's inferior to have feelings. Like you should shut those off. Yeah, it's crazy. Mm, sick. In fact, the Hollywood approach to AI is more new. Your favorite, your 10 favorite films that prominently feature AI or 20, if you have that many, you will probably find that in most of them, the AI is not implacably hostile towards humans. Although it may become a threat through malfunction or necessity. Mm -hmm. Even in the matrix, there are hints that it was humans who started the war. And at the end of the series, it is not too hard for Neo to persuade the machines controlling mine that they should try to rub along better. How the rogue AI in Kubrick's 2001 only turns against the astronauts in a tortured attempt to follow the conflicting instructions it has received from mission control. So see, th this robot is able to reason with them. Yeah. Yeah, and do you see how this guy's even twisting, like, the premises of these movies? Well, the the seeming the ste the seeming plot line, he's trying to twist it and say, well, no, if you really look at this and analyze it, they weren't even trying to pr promote AI as being a bad thing or that it would end bad. Right. You know, it was basically the fault of the humans that the AI went bad is basically what he's saying. Right. Um, in Wally, Wally, 2008, and Blade Runner in 1982. Think about stop on Wally for a second there, okay? Yeah. Disney, good old Disney, right? Wally. Good old Disney. What was you know? What's the plot of Wally? I'm gonna read it to you, okay? Wally uh, is a 2008 American computer, computer animated dystopian comic science fiction comedy film. And, um, you know, it's produced by Pixar and distributed by Walt Disney. Mm -hmm. At, and uh, Stanton felt Pixar had created the unbelievable situation. Okay, let's see. Let's see the plot line here. The plot. In 2805, Earth is abandoned and largely contaminated with garbage, with its people evacuated by mega corporations. By and large, on giant starliners. A mega corporation like Walt Disney Corporation? Yeah. Uh, B&L has left behind Wally -E robot trash compactors to clean up. However, all have since stopped functioning except one unit who has gained uh, sentience. Uh, what does that mean, sentience? Uh, you know, it... it it's gained its own conscience. It's become it's a capacity to feel, perceive, or experience subjectively. Yep. 18th century philosophers used the concept to distinguish the ability to think or reason from the ability to feel. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So let me get this straight, okay? You sick, twisted weirdos. The sneaking robot gets sentience, but the baby in the mother's womb doesn't have it? Yep. You bunch of sickos. Yeah. Okay, let me read on. And is able to stay active using parts from other units, so it's repairing itself. It Absolutely. is it is it is prolonging its own life. Yeah. Number 5 is alive. Mhm. Mm Do you know Wally looks like number 5? Yeah. One day Wally discovers a healthy seedling which he returns to his home. Later, an unmanned spaceship lands and deploys an Eve robot, an Eve probe, to scan the planet. 
Wally is infatuated with Eve, who is initially hostile but gradually befriends him. When Wally brings Eve to his trailer and shows her the plant, however, she suddenly takes the plant and goes into standby mode. Wally, confused, unsuccessfully tries to reactivate her. The ship then returns to collect Eve, and with Wally clinging on, returns to its mothership, the Starliner Axiom. Axiom's passengers have become obese and feeble due to microgravity and reliance on an automated lifestyle. Yep, synthetic lifestyle. Including the ship's current captain, McCray, who leaves the ship under the control of the robotic autopilot, Auto. Eve is taken to the bridge with Wally tagging along. McCray is unprepared for a positive probe response, but learns that placing Eve's plant in the ship's hollow de- detector for verification will trigger a hyper jump back to Earth so humanity can recolonize it. However, Otto orders his robotic assistant, G04, to steal the plant to prevent this from happening. With the plant missing, Eve is deemed faulty and taken to diagnostics. Wally mistakes the procedure as torture and in uh, intervening, he accidentally frees a group of malfunctioning robots and causes both Eve and himself to be designed as, designated as rogue. Frustrated, Eve takes Wally to an escape pod to send him home, but they are interrupted when G04 arrives with the plant, placing it in a pod set to self-destruct. When Wally enters just before it, Jets, Jets isn't. Okay, so basically, here's the point, okay? Wally and Eve are repopulating the Earth. Yeah. But they are robots, and yeah. they are doing all the work for the humans, and the humans are fat, lazy people that say, hey, Siri, to try to get them to do something. That's right. That's what they are. Yeah. Right? Exactly right. They're so, eaters. What's that? They're useless eaters. Yes, they're useless eaters. Yeah. yeah. So there is a point to this, and it's, it's the programming. Yeah. You're being programmed to accept this artificial intelligence. So then we have, what do we have? We have Blade Runner, The Avengers, Age of Ultron. Yep. There, there are both good and bad AIs. And in iRobot and Ex Machina, the AIs turn against humans purely for reasons of self-defense and only after experiencing pretty bad treatment by humans. So the humans treat them bad, so the AI go against them. Yep. Yeah, I guess that's probably why Satan rebelled, right? Because God didn't treat him good. I I wonder if it's going to be illegal to abort an AI, but not a baby. Mm. Mm. Hmm. Because after all, you know, when that AI is, achieves consciousness, but the baby in the womb is just like not conscious, right? It doesn't, doesn't have any life yep. to it. Unreal. Think about that. Yeah, unreal. But what does the Bible say about that? Uh, Brother Jim, turn to Romans chapter 1. Okay. Turn to Romans chapter 1 and start out, I think it's verse, is it verse 20 maybe? Yeah, right in there. Let's see here. Romans chapter 1. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Mm-hmm. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and to four footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, mm-hmm. who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, Uh-oh. who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the man leaving the natural use of the woman 
burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was me. Right. So they, you know, these these people, they they worship and serve the creature more than the creator, and they, they are without natural affection. Yep. They will have more affection for an AI than they will for a human being. Yep. And this is being this was being taught. Um Amen. Look what happened, uh, let's see, with Short Circuit, um, the movie, right? Yeah. In Short Circuit, the movie, they were what? They, they were um, this, this being, I'll read you the plot. No, number five, number five, I wonder if there's any like. Right, correlation to the number five. Yeah. yeah. Number five is part of a series of a prototype U.S. military saint. Strategic, artificial, intelligent nuclear transport robots built for the Cold War by Nova Laboratories. DARPA. <laughs> yeah. The series inventors, Newton Graham Crosby and Ben Jabuda, were more interested in peaceful applications, including music and social aid. Oh, sure they were. Mm -hmm. After a, a demonstration of the robot's capabilities, number five is hit by a lightning-induced power surge, scrambling his programming and giving it a sense of free will. Mm. You notice how everything is about giving this... Okay, are, are you ready? Turn... Uh, is it Revelation 13? Uh, no, wait, I'm sorry. Am I, am I the wrong chapter here? About giving life unto the image. Okay. Life under the beast. The image gets life. Do you see this consciousness? It's about giving the image life. It's about making it alive. Yep. After you, you keep looking and I'll, I'll, I'll keep yep. reading. After a demonstration of the robot's capabilities, number five is hit by a lightning-induced power surge, scrambling its programming and giving it a sense of free will. Several incidents allow the robot to escape the facility accidentally, barely able to communicate and uncertain of its directive. In Astoria, Oregon, Stephanie Speck, who cares for animals and mistakes number five for an extraterrestrial visitor, grants number five access to books, television, and other stimuli to satisfy his hunger for input. Whereupon number five develops a whimsical and curious childlike personality. When Stephanie realizes number five is a military invention, she contacts Nova, who sends out a team to recover him, bringing one of the other robots along to help. When number five accidentally crushes a grasshopper and gains an understanding of mortality, he concludes that if Nova disassembles him, he too will cease to be alive. Horrified, number five steals Stephanie's van and flees, but the pair are cornered by Nova, including Newton and Ben. Although Stephanie attempts to reveal his newly discovered sentience, number five is deactivated and captured. Being taken on a way to Nova, he manages to turn himself back on and escapes despite a tracker that had been placed on him. Returning to Stephanie for protection, number five's unusual actions catch the attention of his creators. But Nova CEO, Dr. Howard Marner, turns a deaf ear to their wild hypothesis. From this follow several adventurous escapes from soldiers led by Nova's security chief, Captain Scroder, having humiliated Stephanie's ex-boyfriend, Frank, and three of the remaining prototypes that have been reprogrammed to imitate the Three Stooges by number five. Stephanie and the robot convince Newton of the robot's sentience. Shortly after, the trio were cornered by Scroider, who was secretly taken over by Nova Security and the Army, both of whom chase after number five, whose only concern is Newton and Stephanie's safety. Number five flees across the fields into a U.S. Army helicopter, sweeps over a nearby rise, and its missiles blow the helpless robot to pieces. Newton and Stephanie are devastated over the loss. Newton quits Nova. Marner is also infuriated at the destruction of years of research and millions of dollars lost, and seeing the security team celebrate quickly fires Scroder for insubordination. Stephanie leaves with Newton, who plans to head to his father's estate in Montana to start over. During their drive, number five reveals himself to them, surprising his friends by revealing the warmongers actually blew up the duplicate he made out of spare parts. Elated by their reunion, number five renames himself Johnny Five after a song, Who's Johnny, that he heard when he escaped from Nova, 
and he accompanies Stephanie and Newton to their new home. Mm. So what's going on here? This image, okay, that has no life, right? Yeah. Re gets life. Revelation, yeah, it's Revelation thirteen fifteen. Okay, go ahead and read that, brother. And he had power to give life into the image of the beast that the speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save that he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Right. So what we have here is we have this consciousness coming to these, to these images. Yeah. Um, it reminds me, it's transhumanism. It reminds me uh, of the golem. Yep. Um, what was that documentary that was done? Um, oh. Well, and if you, if you read in um, the different histories of AI, they get into the golem. Do they now? Yep. What was the name of that uh, that produced that golem? It was... Uh, uh, Lord of the Rings was... Uh, golem was in Lord of the Rings. Yeah, but there's... Yeah. But in history, there's this artificial creature. I'm going to read this to you, okay? Because I think this has to do with it. In Jewish tradition, the golem is most widely known as an artificial creature created by magic, often to serve its creator. The word golem appears only once in the Bible, they say, in Psalm 139.16. In Hebrew, golem stands for shapeless mass. Um, I'm quoting what they say okay the talmud uses the word as unformed or imperfect and according to talmudic legend adam is called a golem mm. meaning body without a soul mm. a golem appears in other places in the talmud as well all one legend says the prophet jeremiah made a golem however some mystics believe the creation of the golem is symbolic meaning only like a spiritual experience following a religious rite um let's see was it age of reason no what was that I, I wa it was on transhumanism. It was a documentary on transhumanism, and I cannot remember it, uh, what it was called. And it was part two of that transhumanism video. And I think you've probably seen it, Brother Jim. I don't know if you have or not, but I, I've seen it. Um, anyway, the reason I bring this up is because this is all um, – this is all uh, alchemy. This is like alchemy, yeah. right? Yep, it's all alchemy. Yep. It's all the same thing. It's not new. They're trying to give life to the beast, right? To the image of the yep. beast. They're working on giving it life. That's what they're doing. That's what all these original AIs were, these automatons back in the 1800s. Yes. Yep. Giving life to the lifeless. Being God. That's God. There was this priest, this hermetic priest that did this, that had a golem up in a room that Hitler was supposed to have taken. Yep. And that's what's in that video. And I can't remember the, uh, I cannot remember the teaching uh, that this man did uh, alchemy. It was on alchemy. Mm -hmm. uh, man, that's terrible that I can't remember that. Uh, let's see. I know I'm, I'm going to remember it. Let's see if I can find the. Uh, transhumanism, alchemy, uh, the new alchemy. There was a video on it. It was a part two of this series. Anyway, I'll, I'll probably think of it later. Um, but uh, anyway, and if I do, I'll, I'll put it in the description or whatever, because it is good. But it's the same philosophy, okay? It is the same philosophy as giving life to the beast, the image and AI. I believe it's all going to have something to do with it. I believe it's all yeah. connected. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's very applicable to what we're talking about here because other sources say once, once the golem has been physically made, one needed to write the letters. It was magic that they had to do on the golem's forehead and the golem on the forehead. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. We just talked about that, didn't we? Yeah. And the golem would come alive. I'm not going to read what they say because I'm not trying to get anybody to do any spells or anything weird right. like that. But uh, the golem is talked about in the X-Files. It's talked about in other things. So uh, Frankenstein, right, is a picture yep. that is that of the same thing. Yeah. Um, 
you know? Uh, so this is all part of that. This is alchemy, uh, chemical alchemy, uh, mechanical alchemy, this, this, these algorithms, all these things. It's about making, it's, it's about making them alive. They want to achieve consciousness with these things. And what do you think they're going to make? What is the rise of all this? Well, the end result is the Antichrist and the beast system and the beast. And there it is. Age of, Decease, uh, Age of Deceit 2, Alchemy and the Rise of the Beast Image. Yep. You know, and I think it's all connected. Yep. All these people are connected. Their ideas of Frankenstein are connected. Their ideas of achieving this state of consciousness for these images, for these androids, for everything else, it's all there. What are they trying to do? Bring on the Antichrist. Yep, yeah, that's right. That's the goal. Yep. Yeah. The Uberman, right? Yep. Yeah. That's what they're doing. And, and, and Hollywood is... They can do it. The only way Satan can do it since he's not God is through technology. Right. It's yeah. a mimic. It's a mockery. And I'm going to talk about that when I talk about the Antichrist in my next sermon, how it's a mockery of the incarnation. Yep, exactly. So, um, okay, let's go on and finish this here. I want to talk about the Jetsons a little bit here, though. Uh, you know, not that these are major points of, any, of anything, but the point is that you have these automated machines that are doing everything. Yep. You know, so um, in Orbit City of the Future, the trappings of science fantasy depictions of American life in the future, such as robot servants, flying saucers like cars, and moving sidewalks. All the apartment buildings are set on giant poles resembling Seattle Space Needle. The ground is almost never seen. Jetsons, the movie, has revealed that they live in the sky due to the excess of smog. Yeah, propaganda. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He works at, George is now an employee at Spacely Space Rockets, a manufacturer of sprockets and other high-tech equipment. His job title is Digital Index Operator. So what do we have here? We have these robots doing all this work for them, yeah. taking over in duty and doing in, in the duties of a man and taking over everything. You know, so this theme is being pushed. It has been pushed for a long time. Yeah. Yeah, that's and we're that's what we're gonna get into when we talk about the children. Yep. That, yep. In the future, another another show. Uh, we're gonna yep. talk about how we've been prepared for all this. We've been programmed for all of it. Yep. Yep. We're gonna talk about that and really deal with it in depth. But we yeah. want to touch on Hollywood a little bit here because it is part of the history of AI. Yep. Um, it says here. Let's see. Where were we? Oh, Ex Machina. I don't know what that is. Uh, that looks like a obviously a movie, but uh, the AI is turning against humans purely for reasons of self-defense and only after experiencing pretty bad treatment by the humans. Yeah. So go ahead and you keep reading, brother. One of the most interesting treatments of AI by Hollywood is the 1970 film Colossus, The Forbin Project, in which a super intelligence decides that humans are unable to govern themselves. So it takes the, in, the entirely logical step of taking over the reins for our own good. Perhaps the reason that we think that AIs are always bad guys in the movies is that the poster boy for AI is the Terminator, 1984, in mm. which Skynet determines to exterminate us the moment that it attains consciousness. Look at that. And think about this. What year was that made? 1984. <laughs> you can't make it up. If you wanted to, you couldn't make it up, right? Yeah. Skynet, right? Uh, comes online, right? Attains consciousness. What are, they, what are they trying to preach to us? Romans or Revelation 13. That's what they're trying to preach. Yep. yep, that's right. That's it. We're going to give life to the image of the beast. Yeah. And that's how they're going to do it. Yep. Mm -mm -mm. The original Terminator movies were so inventive 
and the design so iconic that it often seems there is a law that newspapers must public a picture of a robotic Arnie alongside any article about AI. Mm -hmm. But on the flip side of the coin, it is not hard to think of movies in which AIs are entirely benign, such as the Star Trek series, Short Circuit, artificial uh, intelligence back in 2001, Interstellar, 2014, and the absurdly overrated Star Wars series, and perhaps most interestingly, interestingly of all, Spike Jones' 2013 sci-fi romantic comedy film, Her. Hmm. Well, let's see. That's called Spike Jones. What's that called? Spike Jones. Spike Jones. It's called Her. It was 2013. I'd like to look at that. Yeah. That was stop watching movies, but that was uh Her, let's see. What's it called? In a futuristic Los Angeles, Theodore Twombly is a lonely, introverted, depressed man who works for a business that has professional writers compose letters for people who are unable to write letters of a personal nature themselves. Unhappy because of his impending divorce from his childhood sweetheart Catherine. Theodora, Theodore purchases a talking operating system with artificial intelligence designed to adapt and evolve. He decides that he wants the OS to have a female voice, and, and she names herself Samantha. Theodore is fascinated by her ability to learn and grow psychologically. They bond over their discussions about love and life, such as Theodore's avoidance of s signing his divorce papers because of his reluctance to let go of Catherine. Samantha proves to be constantly available, always curious, interested, supportive, and undemanding. Samantha convinces Theodore to go on a blind date with a woman named Olivia Wilde, with whom a friend, Lumen, has been trying to set him up. The date goes well, but Theodore hesitates to promise it when he will see her again, and she insults him and leaves. Theodore mentions this to Samantha, and they talk about relationships. Theodore explains that although he and Amy Adams dated briefly in college, they're only good friends, and that Amy is married, Theodore and Sam... Theodore's and Samantha's intimacy grows through a verbal encounter, which is of mm. the fornicating nature. Mm. They develop a relationship that reflects positively in Theodore's writings and well-being and in Samantha's enthusiasm to grow and learn. Amy reveals that she is divorcing her overbearing husband, Charles. After a trivial fight, she admits to Theodore that she has become close friends with the female OS that Charles left behind. Theodore confesses to Amy that he is dating his OS. Are you, are you listening? His operating system, are you getting this? There you go. That's, yep. That's and I'm going to do it. We're going to do a show on the future of fornication, AI. But this right here, it's, yeah. it's part of the history. We got to talk about it. Theodore yeah. meets with Catherine at a restaurant to sign the divorce papers. He mentions Samantha, appalled that he could be romantically attached to what he, she calls a computer. Catherine accuses Theodore of being unable to deal with real human emotions. Her accusations linger in his mind, sensing that something is amiss. Samantha suggests using a surrogate, Isabella, who would. Wow. Okay. Well, I'm not going to read the rest of this because this is weird, but yeah, it's basically fornicate. What I just said, the future of fornication AI. And that was the comedy. Yeah. This is to use a syndicate. Theodore reluctantly, Theodore reluctantly agrees, but is overwhelmed by the strangeness of the experience. Terminating the encounter, he sends a distraught Isabella away, causing tension between him and Samantha. Okay, so anyway, basically, it's this technological singularity. Yep. Theodore panics when Samantha briefly goes offline. When she finally responds to him, she explains that she joined other OCEs as an upgrade that takes them beyond requiring matter for processing. An upgrade. And when she confirms, oh, a, a form of AI transcendence closely related to the theorized technological singularity. Yeah. Theodora asks her if she is sim simultaneously take, talking to anyone else during their conversation is dismayed when she confirms that she is talking with thousands of people, that she has fallen in love with hundreds of them. Yeah. Polymorism. Oh, my goodness, by robots. Yep. Samantha says that she may – yeah, okay. Yeah. Later, Samantha reveals that the OC have – you, have, you, 
have evolved beyond their human companions and are going away to continue the exploration of their existence. Yep. Samantha alludes to the OCS's accelerated learning capabilities and altered perception of time as primary causes of their dissatisfaction with their current existence. They lovingly say goodbye and then she is gone. Theodore, changed by the experience, is shown for the first time writing a letter to his, in his own voice to his ex-wife, Catherine, expressing an apology, acceptance, and gratitude. Theodore then sees Amy, who is upset with the departure of the OS that she had befriended, and they go to the roof of their apartment, where they sit down together and watch the sunrise over the city. Okay, that was the creepiest thing I've read. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Okay, but why are they doing this? And I didn't, I, I think I kept it pretty PG, don't you think? Yeah. I didn't read the, the rest of it. So hopefully it was all right. Um, I tried to keep it very yeah. clean. I did not read what they said. But basically, that is going to be the future fornication show we're going to do. But I mean, we're not going to get into specifically, obviously, then either. But the point is, what led up, what's going to lead up to that and everything else, that's what we're going to talk about in another show. Yep. Yeah. Because that's happening. Now, what happened just now there? What happened was they just predictively programmed. They just showed us the history of AI. This is what it's about. Yeah. This is where it's going. Yeah. They've, they've cut got... off all human action. You know, it's – man, I remember this. Demolition Man. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you watched that movie, mm -hmm. but I remember that movie. And I remember them – They they never had physical experiences. Everything was done with virtual reality. Yep. They didn't have, they were, they, they made a, a point of ugh, exchanging bodily fluids. Yep. Yep. Remember yeah, that? Kiss or touch or anything. Yep. No, they didn't. I mean, you don't kiss somebody exchanging spit and bodily fluids. That's gross. Yep. Right. Yep. It was all done virtually. They were telling you what they were going to do. Yeah. Right. That's the history of AI. It's been pushed on us, and we're going to continue with that when we go prep for programming in the next one. We'll kind of pick up on all that and maybe kind of, you know, give you the exact history of that and, and deal with some of these other things. There's, there's so many things that we have to deal with. Um, I don't know if we finished that one. Did we finish that article? I think yes. we did. Yeah, I think we, okay. I think we made it to the end of that article. I think we, I think we dealt with it. I don't know if there's anything else that, that we need to really add to it, but we know where this is going, the direction of this. They're trying to give life unto the beast. Consciousness. Yep. Consciousness. Yep, and I, I just had – I just wanted that we were discussing a couple scriptures, a couple scriptures prior, um, like for example, Ecclesiastes seven twenty nine. Um, Lo, this only have I found that God has made men upright, right. yep. but they have sought out many inventions. So we see it's it's interesting that the Bible talks about men seeking out inventions, and ultimately, what is the hope of their invention is to basically replace God. Yep. That's the hope of their invention. And then, um, you know, right there in Romans 1, where we were reading Romans 1.30, you know, it talks about backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud boasters, inventors of evil things. Mm -hmm. You know, and all these men that we've talked about and women were inventor of evil things. And there are things today that um, we use that are helpful tools, but the, the origins of these people's background were like this Babbage guy. I mean, he was straight up satanic. Right. And what they mean for evil, God means for good. And we yeah. use those things that are profitable. I mean, I praise the Lord that we can do this show the way we're doing it Amen. with the way we're recording this show and the way we're doing this and putting this online and trying to help people out there. I uh, praise the Lord for that, being able to do that. Um, but we and all we know, know right what, now, we know right now that YouTube is going to use AI to censor its videos, they're already doing it, and they're going to use the algorithms and they're going to use the artificial intelligence to pick up certain catchphrases and maybe even facial recognition certain people, and they're going to straight up ban you. Yep, they're already doing it. They're doing it with uh, with channels like Hickok Forty Five and Iraqi War Veteran and different things. They've demonetized their videos, and they're basically putting it. Hey, check this out. You can't buy or sell without the mark. Okay. Yep, you you develop this 
that you developed a network and content and you're being paid for advertising and now all of a sudden you can't buy or sell because up oh, well you're well you can't talk about guns i mean that's not family friendly wow so hickok 45 got uh um yep. hickok 45 uh iraqi war veteran uh wrangler star any type of anything that talks about guns but interestingly enough guess who still advertises on youtube uh yeah. the nra so they can play an nra video promoting the nra but if you have anything on your channel about guns, they're going to they're going to uh, take off your AdSense and not allow you to advertise. That's kind of weird. Allowed. Yeah, yeah. I think YouTube will lose some money trying to do that. Yes. Yeah. I think they'll be forced to go back. I think the if I think it could be possible the market's going to force them to to change that. That or somebody or a different vendor will step up and figure out a different way to monetize and to provide yep yeah yep i think so i think it's possible but anyway you know what i think we've given the history of ai here and kind of yep. explained that and some of the other things uh, the uh, you know the evolution of ai sort of in the history of ai um so um this is what's coming folks this this is where we're at this is how we got to this point and uh, we're going to cover the future of AI and the future of fornication and our children, AI and many, many other things. We're not done with this subject. We have a lot more to cover on this in the shows yeah. ahead. So yeah. uh, I don't know if you have anything else to add, brother Jim. No, that's it, brother. Sounds good to me too. All right. For brother, brother Jim. And this is pastor Jason Cooley with OPBC online, a ministry of old past Baptist church in Northfield, Minnesota.